come to give him the glory that is due to him on tonight. Amen. Come on, put those hands together and bless God with us. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. You are the blessed name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Come on. Come on and put those hands 
sweetest name I know. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. Lord, I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Help me say, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord. Because you care for me in such a special way. Oh, that's so wild. But I lift you up and I'm mad. Tell the Lord I love you. 
Yes, I do. I love you, Lord. Because you care for me. In such a special way. Oh, that's why. But I lift you up. I magnify you stand on your feet wherever you are. Spend the next few moments with the God you love, letting him know how much you mean to him and how much he means to you. I don't know how you honor God, but this next few moments is between you and God. Now hold on, let the music play softly. Kiss him if you will. Tell him how much you love him if you can. We'll spend this moment with him. So, Lord, we're here tonight because we love you. No matter what the season is, no matter what the reason looks like, we want you to know personally and publicly that we love you. No matter what our struggle may be, no matter what trial has befallen us, God, please hear this. We love you. And it's not like we loved you first. You started this whole love thing. So God, we want you to know that at best we can do is love you back. So God, I say on behalf of every believer here who know what their tears taste like, we love you. I say on behalf of every saint who's had to go through a season of sorrow where they've buried a loved one they didn't expect to say goodbye to. Amidst the losses, we say we love you. Lord, in the midst of being in the presence of those who may be ill and infirmed, hoping to get better, hear these words, we love you. You make life worth living for us. Without you, Lord, life makes no sense. But with you, every day gets sweeter as days go by. So, God, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We bless, thank, and adore you. We exalt you. We extol you. We admonish, appreciate, and applaud you. That without you, God, we have nothing. But with you, we have everything. Thank you for being a healer, a bow down head lifter, a tear wiper, strength when we're weak, hope when all seems but futile, when we're troubled, we'll be said. Hallelujah, God. That is our cry tonight. In that name which is above every name, which supersedes every name, which has authority over every name. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we say thank you. And all of those who can't help but love the Lord a whole lot, shout amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise in here. And the young 3920, while you stand, help me welcome the rest of the world through our worldwide web-based streaming ministry. Thank our media team. Y'all give them a big hand clap. Thank you, those who are streaming us. Give Pastor Albert Moore a big hand clap for standing in my stead. 
today. Such a wonderful, wonderful relief to know that they are in good hands here at the Anna Young Church. All of our guests, if we have any, raise your hand. If we have anyone visiting with us, if you're not a member, I want to make sure we say good evening to you. Anybody visiting tonight? No guests? Okay, we'll hold with that. Then here is the question. 8 o'clock, raise your hand. Let me see where y'all Oh, my goodness. 10 o'clock, y'all raise your hand. Hear what I want you to do. I want the 10 o'clock folk to meet the 8 o'clock folk and the 8 o'clock folk to shake some 10 o'clock folk hand. And some 10 o'clock folk to find some 10 o'clock folk you don't know that go to 10 o'clock. And some 8 o'clock folk to find some 8 o'clock folk you don't know go to 8 o'clock. And by the time you get through shaking hands, you ought to be met a good two or three people that you've never met before. Make that happen right now, right quick, right this very second. Do that. tonight. John chapter 12. If you have your book back to the table, make sure you take notes on this particular day. John chapter 12. I think this is going to be day number. Hold on. Let me get it. Let me get it. Uh, I'm doing the lesson that is slated Lord, I don't know which lesson this is. It's John chapter 12. That's what I want to say. Day 18. But I, I don't think I'm... What, what's the day 18 lesson for today? Day 13. Hold on. I want to go backwards because I missed something. And I want to cover this. It's so important to me. Go back to John chapter 12. Make personal notation. I want to deal with that there's still seats open at the table. Do you see that? Is that day 13? Go to that day. John chapter 12, day 13. I want to pull on that. Get something to take notes with on that day. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, do you see that? Came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead. You see that? Whom he raised from the dead. There they made a supper. They made him a supper. And Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them. Everybody say one of them. Hold on, highlight that. That's what I want to deal with today. That there was, he was one of them that sat at the table with him. Say amen. 
Amen. Grab a neighbor by the hand, hold it like you love God, and just say, neighbor, I've got good news. There's still some seats open at the table. Amen. You may be seated. The grass withers, the flower thereof fades, the word of our God shall last and stand forever. Ushers, you may retire if you yet stand. Sister Darby, the table for those of us who can remember having to eat at it was a place of divine provision. God met our needs every single time either with stuff that was just cooked, stuff that was left over, or stuff they made up with what left us in the kitchen. The table was a reminder of one sovereign attribute of God. Write this down. God will provide. <laughs> I need about five of y'all in here right now who can just say without any question, Pastor Adolf. Well, here is how you know God's been providing for you. When you ain't never been rich, but you ain't never missed a meal. Yeah. That no matter how bad things have been, God has always put food on your table. Amen. That no matter what it was, God somehow provided it to you and for you and fed you. Even if you don't remember who cooked it or where it came from, God has provided Having said that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to rush to the fact that coming home after church for us when I was growing up was a wonderful thing to do. Number one, you could take off your church clothes. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. For those of you who are too young to understand this, we didn't wear ordinary stuff to church when I was growing up. You had club clothes for the nightclub. You had school clothes for the schoolhouse. But when it came to going to church, you had stuff that you were supposed to go meet God in. And when you got home, the first thing my mother would say is, y'all go take those church clothes off. Woo, what a relief. Uh, and then after that, the melodious smell of the pots and the pans, warming up food and cooking stuff new would bless us. Vanilla, it would be stuff served like fried chicken, fried pork chop. You don't eat yours fried. Smothered pork chop, rice and gravy, collard greens, candied yams, ham, all kinds of stuff. Just, it's about to go down. And I can remember, ladies and gentlemen, where we would have a table so clustered and cluttered until we couldn't get anybody else's feet on the table. That would be that moment where somebody who had come home from church with us would find themselves eating in the living room and mama wasn't having it. Couldn't eat all over the house. Had to come to the kitchen and sit at that table. And when we got there, I could hear her maternal voice saying this loudly with a sense of joy. There's still some seats open at the table. Even if they had to sit a little kid on their lap and slide another chair in, there was always at least one more seat. I think it's a picture-perfect paradigm of what coming to God is like. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter how many seats are occupied, there's still one more seat available. I think what the church often missing, Pastor Jeremiah Jackson, is we see the table of our God as closed off and only for us. But the shout of the night is the same God that's been providing for you has room for somebody else. Come here, ladies and gentlemen. The dynamic narrative of tonight has its core crux and century in the story of Lazarus who's been resurrected from the dead. 
The shout of the night is not only that God has the power to resurrect a man who's been dead four whole days, but ladies and gentlemen, he resurrects him and takes him, never forget this, to a table. If I ask you, after Lazarus was resurrected, what happened next? You go to Antioch, everybody say he went to a table. He went to a table because it was proof positive that he was alive because dead people don't eat. When they get to the table, ladies and gentlemen, the table has been set for Lazarus. But there was room for others to join him. And that is where I want to pitch my tent for about the next 18 minutes, Deacon Dale Harrison, because I believe the picture-perfect paradigm and this pericope shows us that God is too big to be Baptist, too holy to be Pentecostal, too intelligent to be Lutheran, too smart to be just one denomination. He is not just Catholic. He is not just AME or CME. You will discover one of these days that God is for the whosoever will. Let him come. We're going to be shocked to end up at the table sometime because some folk who look like church folk won't get a seat. There'll be some folk with tattoos on their neck, gold teeth, dreads, hanging stuff, dangling. They'll be sitting there talking about, pass me the lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, here is why. This table is reserved for those who fit in the category who says, if God has a seat for me, I want it. Ladies and gentlemen, three quick principles and I'm out of your hair tonight. Number one, what we see in this text is grace extended. Write that down. That ain't in the book. Grace extended. Dick and Darby, how far does grace extend? Where does grace stop? How deep can you sink before grace can grab you? How far can you be gone before grace can renew you? How messed up can you be before grace can save you? How low can you go before grace can... I'm about to shout by myself. Wait, everybody say this one word. Just say grace. Grace, uh, grace is that part of God that is his self-expression to all of humanity. When God wants to show the world what he is like, he shows all of us grace. Grace is written in the Bible 3,376 times. In the Old Testament, it comes from the word hane. Everybody say hane. Uh-huh. It literally means favor. It means that God extends to everybody a certain degree of, say this word, favor. Uh-huh. And in the Greek New Testament, it's chorus. Guess what it means in Greek? Favor. So no matter where you find the word grace, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it means one thing. Everybody say favor. The reason why it's favor in the text, watch this, Dick and Harrison, is because what's on the table has been provided without a tab for anybody sitting there. In other words, nobody came in and paid the bill. The Lord picked up the tab and paid the bill for everybody who would dare say, make room for me at the table. I need five of y'all in here who've ever gone to dinner and somebody else picked up your tab. Doesn't it make you feel like, hallelujah, thank you. You should have ordered some more stuff. I'm like, wait, if I would have known you were going, you know, just at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the grace of the text, Dick and Barry Nix, is that the tab has already been paid for. Wait, 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 wait. The grace extended here, ladies and gentlemen, says to us, Lazarus is welcome, but so are others who realize they need me. If you are self-sufficient, self-aggrandized, self-promoted, self-saved, self-holy, there is no seat at the table for you. I thought I would have had an amen. 
I'm going to say it again. If you are self-sufficient, self-aggrandized, self-saved, self-promoted, you think you're going to get to heaven based on your own good works, there is no seat for you. I'm going to say it a third time. If you are self-promoted, self-aggrandized, self-saved, you speak in tongues, you never make a mistake, your past is behind you on a scale of 1 to 10, you think you're a 10. You show up and think you do Jesus a favor for being here. I say to you, the shocker of the day is, with that mindset, there was no seat at the table. But if you can say, God, I'm not all that I should be. On a good day, I miss it two or three times. But I got enough sense to want a seat at the table because can't nobody fix it for me like you can. By the way, God, I have some secret private struggles that I have to get over. And as long as you keep working on me, I promise to keep your hand on me because without you, I'm not going to make it. Oh, yeah, and God, just one more thing. If you could just delete my past to protect my future, I would be so happy. Oh, and just two more things. God, right now, sometimes I find doubt in my heart where I really want to believe you, but sometimes I kind of question thing. If you could kind of build up my faith, tear down my doubt, increase my wisdom and push me forward, I'd be really happy. Oh, and just last thing, I know that without you I am nothing, but with you I can do all things. If that's your attitude, there is a seat at the table with your name on it that says grace has been extended. Can I give you a good Bible study note? Hey, Chairman Limbrick, Jesus never once used the word grace. Out of all of the words that he spoke that we have chronicled virtue, Jesus never said grace. He never mentioned grace. He never articulated grace. He never even put grace in a parabolic teaching, which was totally about grace. Why, Pastor Adolph? Because he was so busy showing us what grace looked like. You have to be blind not to see it. What does grace look like? Grace looks like 5,000 hungry people and they're following Jesus, but ain't nobody got a meal but a little boy. Jesus takes this meal, breaks this, blesses this meal, blesses it, tells the people to sit down and feeds 5,000 people. He doesn't charge them for fish. He doesn't charge them for loaves. And he gives 12 baskets of leftovers to the disciples. What do you call it when you show up with nothing and leave full? I need for everybody to shout one word, grace. Wait, what do you call it when a woman has been caught in the act of adultery? Folk from the church house caught her in the act. I'll talk about that a whole nother time. They catch her, bring her to the Lord, and the Lord says, I tell you what, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And all of them left from the oldest to the youngest, and then he told a lady, go and don't keep living like you've been living. What do you call it when God knows about who you are in secret but gives you another chance? Somebody just shout grace. What do you call it, ladies and gentlemen, when you've been sick for 12 years and doctors have taken all of your money and instead of you getting better, you got worse. But somehow you heard Jesus was going to pass through town, press through the crowd, touch the hem of his garment, and without an HMO or PPO select, without a primary care physician, you touched him and he, gave, he turned around and said, somebody needed me who touched me and you got healed. What do you say when God says I'm going to heal you without a pill, without a cream or without surgery? Somebody shout grace. What do 
you call it when you're hung on a cross and you've been stealing the whole time. You've been taking people's Lone Star cards out the mail. You've been ganking folk all through town and now your past has finally caught up with you and you end up nailed to a tree. You look over and tell this dude next to you from Nazareth when you get to your kingdom if you don't mind remember me and he looks over at you and you didn't miss Sunday school, vacation Bible school, you ain't never gave him a tithe. What do you call it when he says today thou shalt be with me in paradise somebody shout grace. It is why ladies and gentlemen the church of the living God ought to be a place where grace is on display for the GED and the PhD, for the wealthy one and for the one that's flat broke. Grace, ladies and gentlemen, is what saves us. Grace, ladies and gentlemen, is how we find our way to God. You don't get to God on your own human merit. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift. I'm preaching good on tonight. I need for five people in here who been loving the Lord a long time but you know without grace you ain't gonna never get a seat I need for 25 of y'all in here who can say thank God for grace grace keeps my children when they are out of my eyesight grace keeps a clock from passing even though I may have hypertension and messed up glucose grace keeps me when I'm in my traffic jam and folk are going and coming for people getting in of my lane. Grace takes a bill you can't pay and sends money just to make sure your needs are met. Somebody high five a neighbor and tell them there is room at the cross for everybody that's unsaved. Here's the grace extended Dickinson Rail. There's not just one seat. Okay, wait. Wait, have y'all ever had your feelings hurt? I really got to go home, but my soul is happy. Have y'all ever got your feelings hurt with somebody you knew through a good celebration and they ain't invite you? It's kind of piercing, ain't it? Now listen to me right quick. Because some of y'all don't invite me to y'all little parties y'all have. <laughs> I know why though. Didn't I know why. Because they want to cut up and they don't want to cut. Thank you so much. I understand. But I see it on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. <laughs> Sometimes I feel a little salty. You know what I mean? If somebody dead, you come get me. If you finna throw a party for the living, you leave me out. You know, I kind of feel a certain kind of way, you know. this ladies and gentlemen because it can leave you salty when there's a seat but it ain't yours can I, can I ask you how would you feel tonight if I told you God has a table listen and you've got a seat I'm going to say this about 10 more times God has a table and you've got a seat God has a table and you've got a seat. God's got a table. You've got a seat. You know, that's enough to kind of make you throw your head back. God's got a table. So if you don't invite me to yours, I still have his. That is, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of the provisional grace of God extended. And Deacon Darby, he extends it to the Democrat and the Republican, the black and the white, the Jew, the Greek, the Gentile, the barbarian, the Scythian, the Roman. He extends it to every continent, Asia, Africa, Antarctica, North America, South America. He extends it to every creed, every culture, whether you speak speak in Ick, Ox, and Ux, Lopez, or whether you speak the King's English, it does not matter. He is a God that lets us know whosoever will, let him come. 
Secondly, not only do we order, can we see grace extended, but we can see goodness provided. Uh, write that down in your notes. Martha is the one evil in the cooking preparing the meal. Martha, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the scriptures, has always been the sister of Lazarus that appeared to have culinary expertise. Uh, Vernia, there's always one somebody in the house who knows what to do in the kitchen. Let me slow down and say this. Don't be offended, y'all ready? Everybody in the kitchen can't cook. Some folk, you want to pray over that the whole time. <laughs> God help me. But there are some people who are gifted to go into a kitchen and can just make it work. And here is how you know they're making it work. Ain't no recipes nowhere written down. They ain't trying to figure this out. Ain't nothing canned. Ain't nothing stobot. Ain't nothing coming from a box. It's getting quiet in here. Just keep on listening. They are able to walk into that and culinary and use expertise to put it on the table. Here is the good news. Sometimes, Reverend Jeremiah Jackson, God uses the gifts of other people to show you just how good he can be. God, ladies and gentlemen, will take the blessing of somebody else just to bless you with it. I need about 10 people in here who've ever seen God take other people and cause them to be good to you. Open doors for you. Help you when nobody else would. And the irony is so many times God used the least of those to make the best of the type of type gift to you. God uses people that you don't know to open doors for you. God uses people that sometimes you have walked by just to lift you up when you're down. But the shout of the night is this. God is the one behind it the entire time. Let me see the hands of those in here who have watched God use other people to bless you. You ought to touch your neighbor and say when God got ready to bless me. He used some people that just came near me to encourage me, to let me know everything was going to be all right, to lift my bow down head, to push me forward, to let me know that all would not be for loss, that he needed me, that he loved me, that he would use me. Ladies and gentlemen, the goodness of the text is he uses Martha to bless everybody, not just Lazarus, at the entire table. I'm in the city of Oklahoma. One of these Thursdays I've been out, I was in Oklahoma at the largest citywide revival in our country. 73 churches, Sister Darby, are in revival at the same time. So can you imagine having 73 pastors in one city at one time? Hold on. Every participating church is in revival at the same time, which means at 7 o'clock at night, everywhere you can see a church open, they're in revival. I love it. I'm standing in the lobby of my hotel, and Deacon Hillary Giss, my driver who was coming to pick me up, took ill. So I'm standing there just waiting like, okay, somebody going to come get me. It's night two. I hope I didn't do that bad on night one that they want to. <laughs> I'm thinking I did okay. You know what I mean? Just And so I'm sitting there. And y'all, I have been praying a prayer all day. I have been just asking Lord, saying, Lord, you know, just I know I'm not supposed to ask you for a sign or anything like that. But God, if you please with me, just let me know what I'm doing my best. You ever been there where you just say, hey, God, can you affirm me in any kind of way you want to? Just please, God. Wait. And I know I don't need a sign. I got that. But God, if you, if you wouldn't mind, if you're not too busy, Deacon Darby, true story. I'm standing in the hotel 
hotel lobby, got on my black Baptist suit, white shirt, crispy, starch ready, Bible in hand, change of clothes, because I know I'm going to sweat when I preach hard. I'm sitting there, and 7 o'clock comes, no car comes to get me. I said, Lord, I hope this is not the sign. <laughs> I hope this is not the sign that you're sending me. Watch this, Ramona Lee. I'm standing there eight minutes after seven, no car. So I'm just thinking maybe I should catch a taxi or an Uber. At the time, I don't know that my driver has taken ill. A little boy comes up from behind me that I do not know, throws his arms around my way. I turn around looking like, wait, who is this? Ladies and gentlemen, he has the biggest smile on his face I had ever seen. His mom and dad are over there watching him hug me. I'm like, is this your son? They said, yes. He said, but he said, God told him to come over there and tell you something. He looked at me and he said, God told me to tell you, sir, he loves you. Y'all, I could have hit the floor. I was done. I took a picture. I said, can I take a picture with your son? She said, of course you can. I took that picture. I sent it to everybody and said, I don't care what y'all say. God loved me. Wait, because the goodness of God will find you in some of the least expected places. Can I just ask you to do something right quick? Since you're sitting by, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, if nobody else cares, God does. If nobody else loves you, God does. If nobody else cares about your future, God does. If nobody else cares about the tears you cry, the pain you feel, the hurts you go through, God still cares. There is a grace that's been extended. Hold on, everybody say, whosoever will. It's not just a seat for Lazarus. It's for others too. Can I say this to y'all right quick? My prayer for the Antioch church is that we become a church for the whosoever will. Do you hear that? Where people can come broken and leave blessed. Where people can, of every walk of life, no matter where you are in life, find your way to a place like this where somebody will tell you God still has plans. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? And then secondly, not only is there grace extended, but there is goodness provided. Say goodness provided. Martha prepared the meal, but everybody ate. God used her to bless that entire house. Sometimes the blessing of the Lord comes through other people. That's why you want to be careful how you treat people. Watch this. Here's what the Bible says. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press. Come on, somebody been to Sunday school? Press down. Shaking together. Running over, watch this, Sister Darby. Show men give unto you. God will use other people to bless your life. Do you hear that? Lastly, and I'm done for the night. That'll be it for me. Watch this. I don't want, but not only do we see grace extended, goodness provided, but we see God's presence united. The blessing of what's at the table is not what's on it, it's who's at it. I just think I should tell y'all when this came up to me, that's why I said I got to tell them this. See, any table without God is probably not a good table for you to be a part of. I don't care where you go, you want God at your table. Hold on, I know it's some of y'all who go to crap tables, card tables, domino tables, bingo tables. I got it. Don't listen, I ain't here to judge you. I know some of y'all pray for the machine while y'all playing it. Oh, Lord, touch it. You know, I got it. See how quiet it is? Barry, you see how quiet it is? Hey, hey, I ain't getting no amens right now. But just remember this. There are some tables where folk are messy. Some tables where folk are mean. Some tables where folk just like talking about other people's mistakes, mishaps, and mess-ups. But the greatest table in the world you will ever find is a table where God is present. Well, God will make you realize that if it had not been for him, you wouldn't have anything. 
Well, God will make you realize that it is him in the, him that keeps you and blesses you and sustains you every moment of your life. Well, God makes you realize he's preparing a table just for you and it just may be in the presence of your enemies. It is the table where you say, God, wherever you are, that's where I want to be. Can I say this to y'all? So many times as I travel around the country, Sharon, people ask me almost in antiphonal refrain, are are you still in Beaumont? You mean to tell me after all these years you haven't moved to greener pastures? Hear what I tell them, Deacon Dale Harrison. I would rather be in Beaumont with Jesus than to be anywhere else without him. I'm done. That's all I got to say. Ladies and gentlemen, you want God at your table. You want to be in the place where you can see divine supply. You want to be in a spot where you can say, I watch God do that, and I'm not going to try to steal his glory. I'm going to tell you, it was by grace it took place. I think we ought to give the Lord a gratitude moment. Just hold on. If you got God at your table and you are at his, you ought to just lift up your hands right quick and just say, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provisions. And thank you for letting me sit at your table table. Hallelujah tonight for letting me be a part of what you have provided because peace comes from your table. Joy comes from your table. Love comes from your table. Forgiveness comes from your table. Mercy comes from your table. Protection comes from your table. Lord, everything I need comes from your table. Joy comes from your table. My strength comes from your table. Every need that I I have is met because I am at your table and it's not just what's on it it's because my God is there you ought to lift your hands and tell God thank you for always being there when trouble came you were there Lord when it seems like I wasn't going to make it you have always been right there give the Lord a hand clap I gotta stop my soul is about to preach because I feel happy Hallelujah. As we stand all over the building, we'd get to the table after church. We'd have guests from the church that would come. And though my mother now rests with the ancestors awaiting the sound of the trumpet where she shall rise again, I hear her maternal voice, Diana, saying there's still room at the table. Can I tell you why I'm teaching this? So that those of you who are here on a Thursday night will gain a philosophical idealism for Christians that says, if there's room for me, there's got to be still room for everybody else. That no one is too lost. No one is too bad off. That no one is too far away. That if there's still room at the cross, Good news is there's still room at the table. I know when I ask about visitors, no one raised their hand. And so my speculation is that everybody here is already saved. But just so that I can know you got a seat at the table, if you know you got a seat already, lift your hand right where you are. Give the Lord a big hand clap, y'all. That's enough for us tonight. If you're watching me online, and uh, you've had your questions about Christianity. You've never really tried Jesus. I want you to know this. There is room at the cross for you. If you can just say, hey, Lord, I'm not all that I should be. But I need someone to help me be what I'm supposed to become. God says, I'm your creator. I'm your maker. Let me have the rest of your life. And the best choice you will ever make is to make sure you get a seat at my table. Because nobody at my table will miss anything that comes from my kitchen. You ought to sit down and really think about it. And then for those who do know the Lord and you're watching us tonight, you too ought to celebrate like we have by saying, thank you, God, I've got a seat. The tab has been picked up. What I need, his hand shall provide. And his goodness is mine forever. Give the Lord another big hand clap of honor and praise.
Let's prepare our hearts to give as the Lord has prospered us. And while you do that, let me just say thank you all so much for your kind birthday wishes, your kind birthday cards, your gifts. You know, y'all, listen to me. People don't have to be nice. And when they are, I have been taught to let them know I am so appreciative. Thank you for every email, every digital card, every card, every note, every cash app. Just, you know, there are times I wish some of my pastor friends could see what it feels like to be the pastor of the greatest church in the world. And I want you to know I am so thankful, thankful, thankful for y'all and your kindness. Lift your gifts. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for making room for us at your table. Thank you, Lord, even now that there is still room for others. So, Lord, let them come. Weary, wounded, and sad, let them come. In the name that's above every name, the only name that really matters, the name Jesus. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling, to the only wise God we shall ever, 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 ever know. To our King, immortal, invisible, and eternal, to him who sits high and looks low. May grace, might, majesty, peace, power, prosperity, and dominion be his forever and forever and forever. Let every heartfelt believer that loves the Lord Jesus Christ sing this final word. Ah, amen. Go in peace. You are with you.